button without telling anybody. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 167 of Divi Chat. Today, we're going to talk about how to price a Divi website. It's probably going to be a great topic for a lot of folks. And great news. We have Big news. some long lost co-hosts returning and we are super happy to have Tammy back with us. In fact, yay, Tammy! Yay! She's gonna get to introduce herself first. So go, As Tammy. As she should. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Tammy Grant, and I'm from Orlando, Florida. You can find me at sunflowercreatives.com and on Twitter at your block place. Even though I don't use Twitter a lot, I really <laughs> am trying to <laughs> use it more. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'm super stoked to have you back, Tammy. I know you've had some fun stuff or not fun stuff. I'm not even going to joke about it. You've had to deal mm-hmm. with it, but we are super happy to have you back with us. So glad to be Sarah. back. Hey guys, Sarah Oates from Enjoy Web Studios. It's dark. I promise it'll get lighter if you're watching this <laughs> as the episode goes on. Um, and you can catch me at endure.com.au or Endure Web on the socials. Although, much like Tammy, I'm not really on socials. Something happened to me during Corona and I just like shut down. I just hibernated in my own little world and I barely open Facebook and I don't look at Twitter. And so, you know, you'll be lucky if you find me, you're probably better to go to my website and fill out a contact form if you want to get in contact. <laughs> you're, to be are you social media distancing? Yeah, I think yeah. I am. I think it was just all too much. <laughs> and I just shut down and I actually kind of liked it. So I'm a bit off the grid at the moment, but you can find me on uh, my website. Oh. Yeah. Unless you get accidentally sent messages to. <laughs> That's true. David sent me random messages the other day through. Actually, Instagram is probably the one thing happened. I go into. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. It's like a friend of Josh <laughs> Pollock, who's another WordPress guy's dog, got shared to Sarah's. It was just, I was like scratching my head like, huh? Well, you're lucky oh, yeah. it was that, right? I know. Well, right. I mean, it's pretty much my feed, you know, innocent stuff. Uh huh. Yeah, that's you. Mm-hmm. That's your middle name, Innocent. Yeah, David Innocent Blackman. <laughs> Stephanie. Hi, David. Uh, I am Stephanie Hudson, and I am here representing Focus WP. I'm uh, broadcasting from not so sunny Charlotte, North Carolina, where it mostly just rains here, and we're not allowed to go outside. So everything that's that's <laughs> life these days. Um, I need to get my little uh glow light on like i need you know those plants that have the glow lights you can grow them inside i think we all need one of those pretty soon but uh, i'm i'm representing focus wp our white label wordpress maintenance company you can find us there at focuswp.co and you can hit us up in the chat there i usually am the one that answers it or you can catch me mostly over in my facebook group focus on your biz on facebook awesome man i'm super glad to have you here as well tim thank you hey everybody tim streifler here and it's been a really long time since i've been on divi chat so i'm happy to be back Um, (laughs) everyone's probably sick of hearing my voice seeing my face um but yeah literally everywhere (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so if you don't know me tim streifler and you can find me online at DiviLife.com. All of my Divi plugins, child themes, layouts, tutorials. WPGears.com, where I have a course with David. David? I don't know where he is on YouTube. What direction he is. I'm trying to point to him. Just do that, Tim. Do that right there. You got me. You, you got me there we covered. Go. Um, yeah. So WPGears.com. And that's it. That's all the things. That's awesome. really that's all. <laughs> that's, intro is over. That's it. The end. <laughs> all right, and my name is David Blackman, coming to you live from Ashland, Oregon, where it is stunningly beautiful this summer. Lots of amazing hikes, and you can find me at AspenGroveStudios.com, Divi.space, as Tim said, WPGears.com, where we do courses and podcasts. And we are all things Divi and WordPress, and obviously we are on Divi Chat. So this week we're going to talk about pricing Divi websites. We've covered this in the past, very long time ago. But, you know, things change, inflation happens, and, 
you know, we just wanted to kind of, we felt like it was a good topic to dive into again. And I, I'm super glad that Tammy's here because I feel like we've kind of got the globe covered in a lot of ways, at least all the way from the West Coast to the East Coast between uh -huh. Stephanie <laughs> the globe and of and America. And, and, <laughs> yeah. The world and, is a little and, bigger than America. <laughs> no, no, no. Sure? And I was going to say I Australia. So. <laughs> That's not what we were taught. Australia too. <laughs> Covering the globe. <laughs> yeah, we're covering the globe because we got Australia here too. In his okay, yeah, that's all that matters. Just America and Australia. That's it. That's, no that's offense right. to any listeners, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're not getting offended. We have some great chatters that join us that are in Europe that I hope are going to chime in on the live chat as well. And they can kind of give us their perspective as well. So, yeah. All right. Always. So, one of the things I'm hoping that we could talk about in this is not so much the price tag as the pricing models that we could also use. Obviously, everybody always wants to know, like, how much does a website cost, right? That's the whole the whole joke of, like, uh, uh, well, how much does a car cost, you know? But if we talk about the different pricing models, that's another interesting topic that I think wasn't covered in the previous time that this was discussed and it's something that i'm actively sort of experimenting with in my agency what was that again uh, stephanie i lost you there for a second actually i was loading youtube chat so i'm sorry <laughs> what was your question again is my question i didn't have a question i just said i would like to talk about um pricing models in addition okay. to just like yeah. the actual price tag because i that's okay. something that yeah. i'm actively interested in. Um, and I think if I may, just to kick it off, I was thinking about like what, what pricing models are there? If you're going to build a website and sell it, or if you're going to build a Divi product and sell it, you could sell um, hourly. You can do hourly, just how much time you put in, uh, you know, time and materials. You could do flat bid where you give a proposal, uh, either a range or a, just a solid number that that's how much it's going to cost, like a price tag. Um, you can do a subscription model, um, which is a more of a monthly thing. And there's something that I've been playing around with that I'm calling the leasing model. So um, is there any, am I missing any? Yeah, you're missing one big one, which is a, we could spend an entire episode on this and that's value-based pricing, which is you're not necessarily basing the price off of the amount of hours you're gonna spend exactly. Uh, it's based off of the value that is provided to that particular business. So for example, a huge fortune 500 company, they're going to be able to leverage what you build for them and make millions of dollars with it, opposed to a small mom and pop shop that, yeah, they're going to see a return on their investment, but not to the same degree. And so basically charging more to companies that can afford it and companies that are going to be able to, uh, you know, get a higher return on it. So that's value-based pricing, which people some people think is unethical because you're charging different prices for sometimes the same exact thing um but that's yeah that's definitely a, a pricing model i actually think with the exception of hourly i think the other ones could all almost fall in could almost also be value based like that the value so base is the way you come up with the number right that's yeah. how you come up with the number but like the scheduling of it we could even break a flat bid down into do you charge 50 percent up front do you charge 30 30, 30, whatever, you know, those kind of things too. Yeah. But the number would definitely, I mean, I think all of us were, are pretty on board with value-based pricing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to a degree. Um, yeah, I, I think, because yeah, like you said, value-based isn't technically a whole separate thing because it mm -hmm. can be like, you could basically have do hourly pricing, but you base the hourly rate kind of on value based, right? So you might charge, you know, $100 an hour for this company, and then $200 a, an hour for this company over here. Um, and then same thing with with a, uh, like a fixed price or pr project uh, pricing, as I like to call it, uh, which to me, that's probably the most common. And in my opinion, that's kind of what, in my experience, clients like the most, because when you say hourly, it's like, well, how many hours is it going to take you? And like, yeah, but just having a price where this is how much it's going to cost and that's it. Um, I find that most clients prefer that. For sure. I, I had someone I worked with who was a really smart businessman when I was much younger. And um, and he explained it this way. He said, when you charge, when you bill hourly, 
you at the beginning of your project, you put yourself and your client at odds because it is in your best interest to work slowly and is in their best interest for you to work fast. And so it, it immediately sort of, even if it's not an overt element, of tension, it does put a, a divide there in like the even it, it, you don't you don't even ask, goodness you don't even have to necessarily be intentionally working slow or anything but there there's always that question you know in the mind of a client or customer with that and I, I thought that was a really good way of explaining why hourly is bad that said I think some things just sort of have to be hourly mm -hmm. smaller think, things in particular I but. think it can be good I think it depends on the circumstance like um, mm -hmm. I've had some clients where. I have just decided that it's in their best interest for us to do hourly because I actually want to give them the best chance of it not costing too much. And so by being able to say, hey, this is my estimate. I think it's going to take, say, 20 to 30 hours. So I give them a range. But then along the way, I can say, hey, just letting you know, at this point, we have done 10 hours. That gives them power because as long as you're updating them along the way, it allows them along the journey for you to say, hey, we're up to 20 hours. We said it was going to be 20 to 30 hours. We still got these things to go. This is something you could achieve on your own. Would you like to do this or would you like me to do this? So being able to kind of give them some control, like some of my clients who have virtually no budget, like I have a minimum price, which maybe we'll get to at some point. There are some clients who don't have that minimum price. And so my way around that is hourly. So my way around that is saying to them, okay, well, normally it would cost this much, but if you can do some of it yourself, I can do some other bits. So how about I do five hours worth of work and then you can see where it's up to. Maybe then you can come in and try and do a few bits and pieces and then I can come in and do another five or 10 hours work. And so sometimes it can actually be really great for the people who are nervous about money. It's just about the way it's framed and whether or not that's a good fit for them. Obviously for big clients, sometimes they need the hourly because that's just the way they function. But yeah, I find if you're going to go hourly, the very best way you can do it is give them a range, give them your best estimate of what it's, how long it's going to take so that they can calculate the money in their head. They've got a range of how much it's going to cost. And then along the way, maybe at five hour or 10 hourly marks, you give them an update and say, this is where we're up to. And then they can feel really confident with, oh, well, that's how far it's progressed at this many hours. This is kind of roughly what I can expect. So that's, those are the occasions where I use hourly and it's quite effective for people who barely have any money, a way that we can work together. For some ongoing stuff, it works too. Tammy, you sell blocks of hours, don't you? I do. As a matter of fact, uh, I will sell hours if the work is going to be like under 12 hours. So that's usually my threshold yeah, nice. for going hmm. to a flat rate model. But um, within the 12 hours, I'll sell like uh, bundles of six hours at a time. At a, at a slightly lower rate than our usual hourly rate. And I found that that really does give the power to the customer, uh, especially with Divi users, because there are a lot of people who are doing their own websites. They're not web agencies and um, they do have small budgets and or watching their money carefully. So using the bundles gives them a lot of power to, oh, yeah. I think I would prefer you work on this and I'll do this part. And, you know, I think I love what you're doing. So I'll buy another set of bundle hours. Yeah, and the good nice. thing about those hours, they don't expire and I'm still able to schedule them. So I'm not like on a retainer where as soon as they need something, I have to drop everything and get working on their project. So yeah, that's it's, good. It's actually a really good strategy for cash flow for your business and stuff as well. Uh, when you sell those blocks of hours, because it incentivizes the customers, Tammy said that she'll typically give those blocks of hours for less cost than her normal hourly rate, you know, which is smart because you're, you're blocking time. People are prepaying in advance for hours that they can use. Like she said, never expires. We've done that with a few clients. Um, we do it normally with clients in-house um, and that have ongoing consistent work who do not want to get onto a maintenance or a service agreement where they get a, a flat monthly rate where we do X amount, whatever. No, we want, you know, this, and uh, then we'll yeah. work some, some type of stuff with Tammy. Uh, and it works really well. It's good for cash flow. If you're, if you're a small business out there and you're looking for a new way to 
generate some cash flow, offer these prepackaged hours for some of your maintenance clients and stuff at a slight yeah. discount, and and it can get money in the house. So how'd you come up with yeah. the the twelve hour threshold, Tammy? I figured anything over twelve hours was really a real project and not just uh, you know menial task. Because a lot of gotcha. times, most of the time, there's like a long list of items that they need help with or uh, maybe just yeah. a section on a website they kind of want to redo. But after, mm-hmm. after 12 hours, I feel like it's a real project and we should really look at the scope of work. And, and so uh, do they, yeah. is that your, um, do, like they buy 12 hours or do you have like blocks? I do blocks of six at a time, but yeah, nice. I usually only allow them to do up to, uh, up to 12. Yeah. I mean, and does it does it roll over, or is it like a do they expire? No, they don't expire. But they also have to schedule. If we if we get off task with the project, uh, like if they get lost for like a week or two, they'll have to <laughs> reschedule. Uh, yeah, any any kind of work. So it's great. Yeah, I, I like only that. way to manage the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. David mentioned uh, that mm-hmm. method, Tammy, being really good for cash flow, and that actually brings up a good point um, that Miro brought up in the chat. Um, asking if anyone sells a website for monthly payment plans, let's say for a year. And, th- and that was uh, an example you gave Stephanie at the beginning, like a subscription type of, of model. Um, and that's something that can be really good for cash flow as well, because you, you, you spread across, yeah. um, you know, some of that uh, project cost, you know, across three, six, 12 months. And so um, it can be really uh, affordable and helpful for the client. Um, and then it's, good for you, you know, it's assuming that you have other cash flow coming in too, because you, you know, even during like some down months and stuff, you still have the cash flow from those monthly payment plans. Um, yeah. and, and I've done that quite a bit working with smaller companies, uh, you know, more startup, uh, new businesses and stuff. And, um, it can be really effective. However, there's one big caveat. You have to make sure that you are hosting the website mm-hmm. for yeah. them. Because um, <laughs> otherwise they, they off. yeah, exactly. They could They'll bugger, just off, bugger as, off as Sarah yeah. said. <laughs> Adorably. It's Australian yeah. word. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's actually uh, no, a really that. rude word. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's it probably sounds a whole lot nicer than what we would say here in the US. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But so yeah, anyways, I agree with that. I, I like and also, that. if you can take a um, deposit, that's ideal. But again, yeah. sometimes people can't afford it. I, I think it works really well for companies who they want your service, but they can't afford your price. Um, being yes. able to say to them, okay, well, um, what if we spread it over six months? Or what if we spread it over 12? And I find that clients quite like the power of choosing. And often I find they want to pay over six rather than 12 months. They kind of want to cap it a little bit earlier. Um, and I also set the parameter. Yes, I have to host it, but also um, they need to go on an automatic payment plan. So um, it, I'm not chasing people up yeah. every month. And so zero, I use zero, which is a finance system. There's a bunch of different finance mm-hmm. systems out there and a lot of them have it available now. There is a slight charge, but mine even has a little tick box that says on sell that charge to the end user so I just say to them look there's a one and a half percent fee as a part of this automatic payment but that's the price you pay for going on a payment plan and I haven't had anyone be upset about that one I think people generally understand that if you have the the convenience factor of paying over time that it's going to cost you a little bit more in the long run I don't I don't think it should cost the same amount like I think you should charge even more than the one percent Sarah yeah. yeah, maybe, but going. I like I like being able to help out these guys who really can't afford it, but they're willing to pay it. They just can't mm-hmm. pay it all in one go. I think yeah. sure. there's a way that I can help but them out as long as they're yeah. willing to pay the fee that goes with that. For me personally, I don't want to bump up the price bigger than that. Um, okay. But that's just me. Obviously, everyone, yeah. play your own game. And that's a really good way to see if they are... Like, for example, if they say, oh, this seems awesome and I really want to do it, like, I love your work, blah, blah, blah. I just can't afford it right now. Yeah. Offering a payment plan is a really good way to see if, if that's true, because, it, you know, if it is true, then like they'll be like, oh, my gosh, a payment plan would be amazing because that's going to allow us to get the new website going and stuff and then stretch yeah. out the cost over several months or a year or whatever. But sometimes it's like, oh, it's actually not you know, you didn't do a good job communicating value because we're like, well, I don't know if I want to do a payment plan. It's like, okay, well then you don't see the value in, 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 in this. So I didn't do my job communicating. And to that. be honest, if they're at that point, 
I don't know that I want to work with you. Right. It's probably not a fit. Exactly. And like for me, that's a red flag. If, if that's not enough. Okay. Well, we're not, we're not good together. Yeah. Depending on your kind of your model. Um, Cause some people do go after this payment plan slash leasing type kind of full on model. That's their whole business model and stuff. They want the monthly recurring revenue. Um, yeah. And, and to where you can do it forever and charge a lot less as opposed to the project price, which you guys are kind of talking about right. your regular rates, your fixed stuff. But I'll, I'll tell you right now, if we do payment plans with clients and stuff, we actually, you talked about increasing the credit card percentage. We actually increase the price of the project. We give them the option to pay for it over a, you yeah. know, an extended period of time. Uh, it's not how we typically do things, but we will give them that option, but we're going to raise the price 10%, you know, on the project um, yeah, I mean, because of the delayed payment and stuff. If we you go buy a car it. and you can't pay cash for it, guess what? You got to get, you got to pay interest on the car. Yeah, you know, it's like, right. that's just, yeah. Yeah, it's just I'm paying for yeah. my house over the course of 30 year mortgage, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> you better believe that I'm spending a huge amount of interest. Yeah, yeah totally. So, so like David said, these are all um, basically flat bid projects that are divided into payments and, yeah. and it could be a, a monthly payment over six or 12 months. It could be the standard, of course, 50% down, 50% at launch for a website. A lot of people do that sort of basic one or like 50, 25, 25, you know, things like that at a milestone. I think, Sarah, I think I've heard you talk about doing that. Haven't I? The like yeah, 50, I do, 25, 25. I do 30, 30, 30, 40. Or 30, oh, okay. 40, 30, or 40, 30, 30. I, yeah, it okay. varies. Depends on um, how much you like them. <laughs> kind of. I, and like it, in some ways, in some ways, it's about kind of, you know, where my cash flows up to. Um, in some ways, it's where like, I'm going to need the 40. I'm going to need that 40 up front. Gonna kind of <laughs> delay, if I get that vibe, then I'm going to get that 40 much earlier. Um, yeah. Because sometimes you can end up getting held off and then you've got that whole 40 at the end. But sometimes for me, that's good motivation to actually wrap get it up it sorted. So it's that kind of, I just make the decision, you know, I kind of change my mind on how I want to do it, but I do find it works really well. And I have mine based on milestones. So they pay the first deposit 30% say upfront before I do anything. Then we do the designs. And once they've signed off on the designs, they pay the second payment. And we don't start building until they've um, paid that second payment and then we build it and we don't launch until they pay the final payment. So the advantage with doing it that way is there's really clear milestones. If they don't pay, we don't move on. So if they don't pay the second payment, we don't start building. If they don't pay the final payment, we don't go live. Um, sometimes I just go live anyway if I really feel good about them as a client. But if I have any hesitancy, we don't go live until you make that final payment. And they're usually very good at making the payment. So for me, it's partially a way of spreading out the cost. It's partially a way of giving me money over time. And it's partially a way of making sure they definitely pay on time. And I'm not chasing up people who have overdue payments. I, I honestly have had no clients in this circumstance. I've had monthly maintenance clients screw me around, but I've never had anyone screw me around on this because... They don't get what they want until they pay me. And so that's worked in my favor by doing it that way. And it also means if someone decides after the design, they're not happy, they want to move on. Well, they paid their 30%. We've pretty much done, you know, 30% worth of money. And so if we both choose to walk away at that point, no one's too upset. Everyone's kind of like, well, I paid, you did some designs. I'm walking away. We we're like, well, you've paid us for what we did. We're walking away. And so we have had that happen before. And that's worked really well because no one's too upset at that point, which is good. Good. Isn't it amazing that we, that the 50% down has become such a, or even 40% down that's, that it's such a st industry standard. I feel like the, like, it you isn't have here. such, it, really it is isn't here, here, I think. Don't you guys think it's standard here, 50% down? I mean, people it don't really me. question it. Yeah. And it I, I think it's yeah. uh, it's so shocking because I think like that seems like it'll be such a hard sell because they don't know us. They don't, you know, if it's a new client, particularly, you know, like they don't like that's a lot of trust on their part that they have to go into it. But um, well, but they can they can Google you and find out mm -hmm. if you're a reputable company and look at reviews mm -hmm. and find out, find your portfolio and contact businesses. So it's not yeah. I don't feel like it's as far of a reach you know, because of that. Now, yeah, 
If I'm going and saying, hey, it's going to cost 30000 I need you to give me fifteen grand, and they Google me, and yeah. they find out crickets, nothing, yeah, yeah we're probably going to have a little bit of concern. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, it's, you know, yeah. So the other models, the, one, uh, the two other ones that I wanted to talk about are um, – one is a monthly subscription, which is different than breaking up one fee into monthly payments. So the concept here that, that I'm working on implementing is with a turnkey site. Mm -hmm. And I built this turnkey site for breweries and then the whole brewery industry <laughs> went down the toilet. So that got paused a little bit. But, um, but the concept there is that it's, it's very low touch it's more of a DIY solution. So it's a low price point. It's like a Wix for breweries is what I call it. So people understand what I'm talking about, but, um, but that's a great way to have some recurring revenue. And um, I was just listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about with things like that, that are monthly payments, even if the payment is low. So like the one plan is like 79 bucks a month, but you don't, but even if there's some that are doing it for like $29 a month or something like that, but you don't think of that number, that's not your profit number. Your profit number is the lifetime value of this person. So how long yeah. are they going to stay and use this? You know, if they're going to be with you for six months, yeah, you're going to, that's a gamble and you're going to probably lose out a little bit. But if they stay with you for years, then, and the, as the lifetime value you know, increases, then, then you're, that's where you really start to turn profit. And for me, the key to that one is automation for sure. Like having it all systematized it could, it could and be, automated. Right. We used to have someone on here. I can't remember who it was, but they worked on the leasing scheme and the scheme was they would build a website for someone and they wouldn't pay for the actual website, but then um, it was all subscription stuff. And so the idea was that, they hosted, they ma managed it, they did build something. And so they built it custom for the people. I, I'm assuming they did some sort of autumn, like, you know, templating in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, but if that person decided to leave, then they lost their website, which I think is a really good theory because there is that, um, I don't know what the technical term for it, but it's that thing of like, once you have something, you don't want to let go of it. And the idea right. of once you've got a loss website, aversion, like having to move somewhere else. Yeah. Having to like rebuild somewhere else. Yeah. They could do that, but realistically you're at least going to get them for a few years. Like I, I'd be very surprised unless they just hated you or they hated the website. I think, you know, no one's going to go somewhere else in the, at least the next two years. So as long as you can kind of feel like you recover your costs in say a couple of years, then after that, all you're doing is winning. I've always liked that model. I've always, I kind of toyed with it in the beginning of the web, my web development career. Um, I, I, you know, I thought a lot about automating that building a multi-site type kind of platform, mm -hmm. going after a niche, doing exactly what you're doing with the crafts. I think it's a great idea. Um, I think long term, I think part of the key is automation and stuff uh, to where yeah. you can templatize things. They can come in, drop their logos, their branding colors, their content and select a template. And you're just kind of hands off and you're managing things. Uh, I do think it can really be successful. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't really met anyone that's doing it, you know, per se, but I love the idea, the concept <laughs> is good i think you know I'm, for, i mean for those listening if, you, tried it. if you're interested in the the turnkey model the multi-site matthew rodella is the guy that you want to go follow he has a course on it he's done it and he's mastered it and there's some great really great facebook groups and things like that but it, it's a super interesting model to me have you did you say you've done it tim i think tim i didn't tried do to, it did you I did it for a very, so mine was completely automated, completely self-serve DIY platform for wedding websites specifically. Right. That's right. And I forgot about that. Yeah. So this was, this was like 2013, 2014. This was like, yeah, way back. You were doing day. turnkey for turnkey was cool. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my, my discovery through oh, that yeah, process yeah. Yeah. is that WordPress can't handle more than 100 websites or so in that ball, ballpark uh, within one multi-site network unless you do major um, 
customizations to the database structure and the way that WordPress stores content in the database. But if you're doing kind of a hybrid approach where it's not completely automated, you know, it's not completely hands off, do it yourself, like you're going to do it, but using your, your turnkey platform, well then you, okay, you have prices a little bit higher. Um, and then also you can just, you know, fill up a hundred sites and then, you know, have another one over here built out by another bucket. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's definitely ways around it, but, like the multi-site um, do-it-yourself platform stuff has gotten really popular the last couple of years. And I think WP Ultimo, that's the software that um, will allow you yeah. to do all this stuff. Um, it's next. I, it's just ridiculous. It's so awesome. Yeah, it's really great. However, I've seen, because I'm in the Facebooks and stuff too, I'm not convinced. I, I don't know. I, I Like David said, I haven't met anyone that's been able to do it successfully and actually make a living from a self-serve do-it-yourself platform built on WordPress. So I don't know if you have that Matt, I haven't. No, I, I haven't. I haven't clicked over yet. It's still brand new, but because I, I just sort of paused it. But, but that guy, um, Matt Rodella, he, he had an agency, but he used to be in the IT field. So he created this turnkey system for IT companies. So he had a very specific niche and it was a workable niche because um, A, he knew all about it. He knew it inside and out. B, they generally had terrible websites and see they didn't care about their websites so that that was their like that was the type of site that they were going to get they didn't want to go get a whole bespoke custom site or anything so he did that but then as those people had decent websites you know of his templates and their businesses would grow then it it ended up being that the turnkey system started funneling business into his agency which was a really interesting turn of events because then it's like once people do, once they grow, we all know this, once they start working with you, unless something real bad happens, you, they're, you're there for life. Like you're, people don't want to go find another developer. They don't want to have to find their passwords for anything. Like they are just going to keep working with you. So it, it ended up being yeah. sort of a double profitable thing for him, which I think is very interesting for most of us in the way that we're all I think what up, I'm so. hearing from the outside of it is this kind of thing is going to work probably if you've got a niche. So if, yes. whether it's fully automated or semi-automated, um, then, or even not automated, but just you have this kind of system where you have this really basic, you know, website Offering. package that you're, yeah, and maybe you have a couple of templates and people pick like from five templates and then you load it up with their content and off they go and they pay their monthly fee ongoing kind of thing. Either way, it's got to be simple stuff. It's got to be a niche. Mm-hmm. It's got to be simple. It's got to be not like they don't need like 500 different plugins or whatever. It can't it's be just custom, a basic yeah. text um, website. But if, if there is a niche around you, like, you know, maybe it's a good option, even if it's not automated, there, there may be right. still a way that you can make it profitable. So this kind of bleeds into this other sort of thing that I've been just experimenting with. I just threw a page up on my site and I had a couple people in March, I had two clients that were ready to pull the trigger and then they were like, whoa, 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 let's just see what happens after the virus. So um, I'm calling it a website lease. I'm going back to the car thing again. So when you have a car lease, a lot of times you can get a nicer car than you could afford to buy for a similar monthly payment but you don't own it. And so this was sort of this concept that I did. So basically it's a higher monthly price point than a turnkey system, but it's built for you. It's not DIY. So it's more like around the $300 a month, uh, you know, three to $400. I think it almost needs to be around that, that car note kind of price point too. you know, like three to $400, like about what people pay for their car. This is my, this is just my personal experience, but Um, so basically the idea is you commit to one year, it includes your hosting and maintenance and basically like the monthly costs over a year's time will pay for the website. So I'm not going to be in the hole as long as you stick with me for one year, I'm not going to make billions, but I'm going to, I'll, I'll be okay profit wise. And then at the end of the year, it's like when you're done with your lease, you can either go take your lease car back and you can trade it in, you know, upgrade to a new model. So you can go upgrade your site to a new site every 12 months. You can make changes to it or things like that, or you can buy your site out. So if you want to keep the leased car that you have, you don't own it. You have to pay money to take it with you, right? You have to 
buy out the lease. And so that's the thing too. So like if you, after the end of your year, if you want to take that and go host it yourself somewhere or go have somebody add on to it, whatever, you can buy it and take it with you. Or you can just wash your hands and walk away. You can just drop off the keys and leave. So, so this is a little something that I'm experimenting with. And I think like because of all these conversations where that monthly thing is so appealing to people, you know, people, everybody has cash flow issues, especially at like smaller businesses. And um, so I think it adds that, but it also has the done for you element. So, and, and just like you said, Sarah, like these aren't like, again, super bespoke custom sites. I call it, it's not custom, but it's customized. That's sort of the language I've been using. Like I'll, I'll, we'll make it look like something you like and your colors and your logos and all that stuff, but it's not like going to be built from scratch, top to bottom to your specification, you know? So anyway, so that's kind of the thing. I'm wondering what you guys think about that. Cause this is something that I'm, I really want to get back into selling these. I've seen some people in my community here who was doing the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. It's really popular amongst um, like local tradesmen, like plumbers and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, those type of people who aren't really particular about the style of their website and, mm-hmm. you know, special branding and such. But what I've seen them do is uh, leverage uh, different phone numbers and uh, the web address in order to get good SEO, local Mm. SEO. Mm -hmm. And then once the SEO is like really in good place, they're able to get a premium on the lease for the website. Okay, so they're going in like, like if, if you or I would go and build a website for Joe's lawn care and mm-hmm. just crush the SEO on it exactly, and then lease that website. So they're exactly. leasing something that's already pulling in leads. Right. That's, yeah. That's a whole I've seen thing. that model yeah. too. Cause yeah, I they're basically too. paying, they're not just leasing the website design and, and hosting and all that. They're leasing the rankings and the, exactly. the, the domain name rank and rent that's pretty smart i actually like that that's, that's i could see david really being nice. all over a thing <laughs> yeah. i like that that's, yeah that's, i remember seeing an ad a yeah. someone was doing um selling a course on teaching people how to do the model of mm. of like website leasing with like ranking and stuff like that yeah i think it's smart you know. Um, so a- Andrew Murphy is watching on Facebook right now. We have a couple people over in the Facebook feed and he says, um, first he says the market will let you know if it's a good idea, which is true. Yeah. And then he said that the yeah. one that Tammy's talking about, she said, they call that rank and rent. Well, there's a name that. for it. Rank and rent. <laughs> mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, I think, um, I think that's the wonderful thing, I guess, about um, being an entrepreneur and a business owner, and you can try different things and yeah. find out what, mm-hmm. what works best for you and stuff, um, you know, because there's so many different ways that you can go. I've always been very intrigued with the value-based pricing model, um, yeah. but I've, I've, I feel like you have to be a very, very strong closer if you're going mm-hmm. after that. Um, because talking someone into, you know, let's say an e-commerce website, which may cost $20,000 to this person, but you're going to charge a million dollars because, Hey, you're Nike and you're going to sell, you know, yeah, but that depends on which clients you're going for. Right. Like, I mean, I could be wrong, but I would say for most of us, we're not going for Nike. Like, yeah. So the kind of clients I'm going for is startups, people who've been going for about five years and then people who've been going for like 10, 15 years. And they're kind of that almost a medium business, but they're not quite like I'm small to medium. That's what I'm going for. The range in that is much smaller. So when you're saying value-based pricing, like someone who's just starting out, They're going to need like my very base price and they might even need a payment plan to be able to pull it off. But Mm -hmm. then you've got people who've been going for five years. They're kind of ready to step it up. You're going to be able to work out where they're at and whether or not they're going to be getting value from their website. And you're going to be able to work out, do you give them the base price or are they getting more value because their business is established and they're starting to have income and they understand things cost money and you can bump that price up. And then you've got the people who you know are reputable in your community. They're getting money in. They've chosen you. You can definitely charge them more. Like I had a client who they went and saw an agency. They were still, they were in that five-year mark. So they were smaller 
they went and saw agencies, agencies quoted them 20,000 and I charged them seven. Like for me, that was still above my base price, but I thought that they were going to get that value from it. And it was still tons cheaper than what an agency was going to charge them. They were going to get good value. And I felt like that was what they were worth. I felt like 20 was ripping them off. They, it I mean, when you're talking, what, when you're talking a pricing episode, like when you're talking about setting a price and you know what their competitors are charging, like that's yeah. like the best well, ever. See, I, didn't, I didn't know it until after I had given oh, them a okay. price. But if you knew, like, what would you have charged? Uh, no, I think I think it was what it was worth, and so that's okay. the thing. Like for me, you're so I good, felt, Sarah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I want to be known for someone who's like, I'll give you guys off. a great deal for only seven thousand dollars. I want to be known dollars. for someone who <laughs> is getting paid money for what I am making for them, and they are getting what it's worth. And so I kind of I feel like. I don't want to just charge heaps and then I become just another agency. I just become another one of the people who people know that they're paying heaps of money just because they're an agency. I just don't, I don't think it's right. Well, and yeah, I, I, but I think I it's somewhat... about what it's worth to that person. Yeah. So I think value-based pricing is really, really important and it doesn't have to be these huge extremes of like yeah, well, 10,000 to a million. It could be the difference of 5,000 to 20,000. And maybe 20 is ginormous and you think, oh my gosh, can I be charging 20,000 for this thing? Yeah. But to the client, this they still would have been charged 30 at an agency. Yeah, well, it depends. I mean, it, you know, agencies or companies do bring different things to the table. Yeah, they do. So, 100%. You know, I, I want to kind of, I'll tie this in with a question that one of our viewers, you know, our regulars, Nancy, McKiska asked, does anyone seek out high-end clients with decent budgets or are we left to maneuver with the type budget type projects, which are smaller, medium-sized projects, which I think most people that follow Divi Chat and that are building websites with WordPress, probably the majority definitely focus on the small to medium-sized businesses. However, there are some companies that do focus on the enterprise level projects like the Nikes and the Starbucks and all of these really, you know, fortune 500 companies and stuff. Um, I know web dev studios um, focuses primarily their clients are the Nikes and all of these companies and stuff. Crowd favorite. Another one. There are some big WordPress companies that focus on those high end ones and you know, what's interesting is, is that, for example, there's really not a lot of difference between, you know, let's say Nike's website and potentially something that Sarah could build. It could, it would look <laughs> identical. You know, I don't know. I've never looked at Nike's website and Sarah's, website. <laughs> well, I'll put, I'll put us out there then I'll throw, I'll put my company out there. I feel like anything that they could build, we could build, you know what I mean? However, they're going to build something and charge it i guarantee you it's going to be off the charts extremely expensive and stuff yes. you know it's not going to be no you know ten thousand twenty or even thirty thousand it's going to be sometimes potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah, easy for a website and, and the reason why it's it's not a like front end what you see functionality issue it's with these enterprise companies you have to build in integrations with yeah. all of their other platforms and yes. systems and stuff. And so that's why it gets really and expensive because it it's be like flawless. Like yeah. any little thing that goes wrong with it, the pressure that as yeah. soon as you bump that price up, like as soon as you are going for even the medium clients, they care about every little teeny tiny yeah. absolute thing and well i think you need to ask yourself the question i mean this is which clients do you go for so this is a whole different topic right but i think it's an important question to ask yourself do you really want the pressure that comes with that or would you prefer to do four like mom and pop shops where they're just so happy and they just love it and it's really easy and you didn't have to do all this integration and you do four of them in the same time that you do this massive one and the person is like onto you like a yeah. hound which would you prefer? Like, it, I know it's a different question, but it kind of comes in with the pricing of hmm? that's what yeah. comes with value-based pricing is the value is well, high, see, the I pressure don't think, is high, the expectation is high. I well, think we're getting off the pro the topic of yeah. value-based. I think that's like, that's more work. 
It's yeah. not that it's of higher value to the client, the end result. That's the, the point of. of that is saying like, if you sell to um, a heating and air condition guy, like an HVAC guy or a long care, let's say a long care guy, right? And he's make, he's charging 20 bucks, or 50 bucks a yard or something. And then you've got a landscaping company that's doing like really fancy extra stuff. And like, if you can get leads to both of them, how much are the leads worth to the first company? They're worth $50 if they get a client, right? And the leads to this one might be worth $5,000. So because of, if you're gonna build, you could build them basically the same website with the same SEO, but this guy's gonna have more value to himself. So you can show ROI that proves the value of that website for him is higher. So you can charge 10 times as much because he's it's gonna be worth it to him. He's gonna get his money back. Whereas the other guy, you couldn't charge him $10,000 for that website because it would take him forever to get his money back out of it with those little $50. He should, he should up his rates is the real problem here, but well, he's going to go <laughs> on the leasing and this is, this is perfect for yeah. the pricing because the yeah. clients, those types of clients are, are going to lean towards the leasing, the payment plan, DIY, all that stuff. Yeah. You, you know, those types of models and stuff. And I agree with you, Stephanie. I mean, the value-based pricing is, is based on the value of the, the the money that the website's going to generate and stuff. Right. Yeah. So you have um, to show ROI for those, and it's it's a, sometimes you can have actual like numbers to show ROI, or sometimes you just got to be like a David Blackman salesman and go in there and prove it to them. With yeah. Your, yeah. With your One flash. thing I will say about value based pricing though is if you are doing value based pricing, I think it's important to say that this is based on the value of the website. Yeah. Reason being that if they come back to you in five years' time and they want a new website, their business is going to be in a different place. And they're going to be like, but you only charged me like whatever last time. And now you're like tripling that price. Like, why is it costing me so much more? So if you're kind of saying right out front, the reason I'm charging you this smaller amount is because this is the value or the reason I'm charging because also if you live in a small town, people talk. And if you've got like a $20,000 client talking to a $5,000 client and they're looking at each other's websites and they're like, holy crap, like, why did I pay so much? I think being able to say to them, this is value-based pricing or however you want to word that, I think is helpful and can get you out of sticky spots when people come yeah. back wanting more in the future. I think most people do not go value-based pricing. Very few people do true value-based pricing because of what Sarah's talking about, the conflict yeah. that could arise and the... Um, you know, the, the issues that could come up you know, with questions, clients questioning, what the hell you right. charge my buddy, Joe, 500 bucks. You charge <laughs> me 10,000. What the hell yeah. Dave, you know, and they're going to feel like they're screwed. So yet you're 100% correct, Sarah, in that disclosing, you know, that, you know, how you're getting to the price that justifying that you're charging so much more than they may be getting somewhere else is, is, you know, and if you can do it good enough, they may go with you. You know, they're probably yeah. going to go with you if you're capable of showing them, Hey, look, if they're the big enough to be yeah. receiving, like I have a base package, right? So right. for me, 5,000 is where I start. Like I don't do a website for less than 5,000. Occasionally, if they're going to be involved, I'll go less than that. But I didn't start that way. And you <laughs> I know, charge more if they're going to be involved. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was thinking about that meme. Yeah. You know, Tim, Tim knows but, it. Tell it, Tim. Yeah, after, it's, after it's. Serve. I, um, I do the work and, and then design, and that's design it. it and I build it. Yeah. yeah. If I design it and build it, it it's, you know, a hundred dollars. If it's, I, if it's, I design build while you watch, it's $150. You know, if I, <laughs> if I build it and you direct, you know, two hundred. You, de you design it, I build it or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then it goes down to you, uh, you direct or you build it and I watch like $3,000. <laughs> it's like the, the more client participation, the more it costs. And yeah. I think it's funny. Sorry, Sarah. I hope it's we funny. didn't derail your thought. Uh, there's well, so much so what I was saying, to talk about on value-based pricing yeah. yeah so what I'm saying was I, I would say 80% of my clients are not value-based priced 80% of my clients are this is kind of my standard price this is what you get for the standard price you want to add on a shop this is what it's going to add you know like it's kind of like a rough 
I can pretty clearly be able to define it by just adding whatever they're asking for. The advantage with that is I can feel super confident. Now my base price started much lower when I was beginning and it's slowly grown sure. over time. But the advantage with that is if someone calls me, I don't feel wavering. I'm not like, oh, well it costs, um, I'm a bit nervous. I just like, that's just what it costs. And I can feel really confident, which means they feel confident, which means often I'll land the sale. But if it's yep. someone who then is, you know, in that 20% where it's the value-based pricing, then that's going to be a different scenario. You're not going to feel as confident, but you need to kind of go in knowing, well, I know somewhere else is going to charge them much more. That's how you get the confidence to be able to, like in your mind, you know, they're going to get charged 40,000 at some agency. Therefore, I, tell you, I can feel super confident in saying, yes, you don't get everything an agency gives you, but you get me and you can, you know, sell your selling points and you can say, and I'm only going to charge you whatever. And you're actually giving them a discount. And that's when value-based five. pricing works. <laughs> Here's the flaw in what you just said, Sarah, that what I'm yes. hearing you saying is you don't believe in the value that you're trying to sell. If you believe that what you're selling them is going to be valuable to them. Dave and I had a, co a phone conversation a while back. I sold a, remember that SEO package I was telling mm -hmm. you about? Yeah. I crushed it. I crushed yeah. it. And I went in there and I charged them triple what I've charged anybody for SEO before. But I had numbers and I was like, you will make your money back in six months. Bare minimum, you'll break even. Like worst case scenario, you will break even. It's a done deal. And so I could walk in there with such confidence. I had stuff documented. I could show them. So the, I was showing the value of what I was going to do and I could sell it like that. But if, but if you walk in and for a second doubt what you're thinking, you know, like, yeah. I don't think it's about what anybody else is going to charge them. It's about what I can, what I can do. Well, partly, my, my partly work, you know, so. it can help you have that confidence. It could. Yeah, it could. Yeah. Like yeah. if you like heard somebody was charging $20,000 for a regular Divi site, you could be like, what? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I could ever feel comfortable doing a real value-based pricing. For me, I would prefer to just have a standard for my base prices. And it may not include some of the small businesses. I just don't think that they would be a good match for me. So I think I would prefer to just have my uh, level of pricing for a yeah. type of client that I prefer because I don't, yeah. I don't think I could deal with, you know, trying to, I don't like selling to begin with. So trying to convince someone that they should pay triple the amount for the website. Yeah. There's no way. <laughs> and some think, of that's yeah. about knowing your business and knowing yourself and knowing what you want to mm -hmm. do. Right. Like I did a medium sized business at one point. And like I said, the pressure was much higher and I hated it. It was awful. I don't want to do work like that. So now when people come to me like that, I just say, I'm not interested. Sure. I could charge more, but I'm not interested in that kind of work. So I think knowing trying. yourself and knowing, you know what, I don't like selling. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are my stock stand prices pay it or don't pay it, go somewhere else or don't go somewhere else. Like that gives you the confidence. You don't have to do the selling because you don't like doing that. So I think, I think it is. And you, you will learn that as you go. Like, I think there were, I've made 5 million mistakes as I've run my business, but some of it is about kind of over time going, well, I hated that, or I don't want to work that way. Or yeah, I got more money, but it was horrible or, you know, and as, over time, you kind of get to this point where you go, this is my niche. This is where I sit. And if someone comes to me outside of that, I'll just refer them on to other people. That's fine. That's not my, yeah. my core business. Yeah. And I guess, you know, my answer to Nancy and her question is, is does anyone go after that? And my point is, is that yes, uh, there are definitely yeah. companies who target and go after those higher priced, you know, yeah. WordPress typically, you know, Stephanie talks about, you know, the integrations of those enterprise type level clients. Most of them, WordPress is just that one part of their stack. Most have multiple stacks that are going in and you need to have you need to have developers that are beyond WordPress yeah. skill sets in order to land. But that may be what you want to go for, right? Yeah. Like and that may, may be. be the business that you want to have and you yeah. want to have the team that can achieve that stuff. And you want to have the jobs that span six months a year just to build. And yeah. that's what you want. And they've got this massive budget, but you just have one client or two clients and that's yeah. all you have to worry about. I think it's a very risky business model, yeah. but if that's what you want to go for, like go for it the, because the point of the pricing the though the pricing thing though is that that's not like quadrupling or quintupling your normal price is not 
because it's value based pricing. It's because there's that much yeah. more work involved too. Is another right. exactly. and part. pressure it's a different argument. and stress yeah. and yeah. needing yeah. to hire another... on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot to, that goes involved to that. Back to Nancy's question about going. What was after Nancy's those question? Higher... <laughs> she said, "Does anyone go after higher price clientele?" Or does oh, everyone okay. just go I for see. like the bottom of the barrel? And, and and David and I actually did a coaching call specifically on this topic in our Divi business course. We're talking about finding your sweet spot in the market. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I think that's, that's a really good principle because I don't think going for the bottom of the barrel clients that want to pay the least amount of money is a good idea ever. Mm -hmm. But I agree with <laughs> well, Sarah. I don't want starting, to do... When you're starting, yeah. you might need to. Like we all had to at the beginning, mm -hmm. right? True. But true. yes. It, but yes. I agree with Sarah that like the enterprise level clients, like more pressure, more work, like, you know, more integration, stuff like that. Like that doesn't interest me either, but there's a sweet spot where it's a company where they're, you know, at the, at, they're a growing company. So they have the budget, they see the value in investing in mm -hmm. their, their company and their marketing and stuff like that. Um, but they're not quite, you know, huge <laughs> yet, but they're not tiny. And so finding out where that sweet spot is and, and, yeah. uh, you know, kind of going after those types of clients. I yeah. think well, that I mean, goes to that goes to that other whole completely different topic, which might be an interesting one as well, is coming up with your uh, how to come up with your ideal customer, doing your customer personas and things like that, which is so, so hard to do for yourself. Like, <laughs> it's so <laughs> difficult. We like I think some of us web people should buddy up and help each other do it. But um, but that's where you start to figure that out. Like, I think t so, Nancy or whoever, there's a lot of people that follow us, a lot of people in my group that are having trouble getting what they think they deserve or what they need to make at their websites to turn this into their full-time gig or whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe, I mean, there's lots of reasons it could be. It could be that your work isn't good enough, but I kind of doubt it. I kind of think it's more like, who are you going after? What is your level of confidence? You know, you have to believe in yourself a little bit or at least fake it till you make it. But if you, you know, if you go and you're not, happy with the price point that you're at, then maybe some of these other pricing models or maybe taking more of a value-based approach, maybe some of these things would be a good idea that could only moderately change what you're doing, but have a much bigger increase on your bottom line. Yeah, yeah I think um, I, I totally agree. Um, we're getting close Thank you. to the hour. Um, I do have a final thought, so don't. don't I know we're up. not. We're we're going to do final thoughts. What I want to do is I want to pose the title to this, you know, episode, which was how to price your Divi website. Yeah. Um, or as Stephanie changed it to how to price your website services. That was um, me. That was Tim. <laughs> Keep giving right, Stephanie Tim. credit for all the stuff I'm saying and doing. Right. <laughs> well, I didn't say that either. Here's, here's what I want to say to that. Hopefully, we opened your. Remember eyes when I said I was from California? to make you realize that there's there's not one answer to that question because there's many True. different yeah. ways that you can price a website depending on your model you know whatever that is um you know so i hope you weren't expecting that oh we're going to give you an a b c d <laughs> one two three four here websites should price, cost five thousand dollars that's yeah. the end <laughs> yeah it depends on you and your business and the types of customers that you're going out and it is done going after it is dynamic you're gonna have to figure that stuff out um jump in the facebook groups ask a lot of questions you know if you're if there's a specific niche that you want to get specific pricing on and stuff because that pricing is very very important most of them undervalue it even mm -hmm. then i like i i don't think it works to kind of say to a group hey how much should i be charging for this niche like, no yeah that's that not... doesn't work because every community is different like even yeah. if within one country everything is yeah. different like yeah, within absolutely. australia where i live i can charge a different price here and two hours away I would have to charge half what I charge right. because You're of right. where I live and the community yeah. that I live in. And the other thing is like the type of clients you're going for. So when you start out, you might be getting the bottom of the barrel people, but you're getting your confidence up. Your skill level is low. So you're needing to charge much less, which means you fit those bottom of the barrel people. And as you grow, as you get better, your skill level grows. You get faster at what you do. You get better at what you do. Your confidence rises. Uh, my 
encouragement to you would be when you're getting out and you if you feel like you're not getting enough money the next time you quote on it just bump it up a little bit whether you feel confident to just go 10 percent or 20 percent or even 50 percent once you get you know just try it out like someone said in the chat the market will tell you whether or not what you are providing is the right kind of value whether the prices are right if you are losing every single pitch you go for your prices probably are aren't right or your skill level isn't matching your prices Mm -hmm. so I think there's one of those things of like it it does fluctuate over time in your business your skill level is going to change your pricing the type of clients you're going for is going to change your pricing the place that you live in is going to change your pricing so we can't give you this is how much this kind of website should cost because there are so many variabilities I could make one type of website and Stephanie could make the exact same type of website and we might charge different purely because what we bring to the table is different. Like, and that's okay because they might be looking for what Stephanie can provide, not what I can provide. So I think it's one of those things, don't get too caught up in what is the ideal price. I think it's about putting yourself out there, meeting with people, playing around with the price and then seeing, okay, I'm bumping it, I'm bumping it, I'm bumping it. And at this point, I feel like this is the place that I rest for a while and then at some point you might think okay it's time to bump it up and just see the trouble is to not get too comfortable there you gotta keep changing it yeah Yeah, you do and and your skill level will keep changing and things will keep evolving but I don't think anyone should reach out and be saying you know how much should a website cost or even saying well I charge this much therefore you should be able to charge this much or why are you charging so much because the variabilities are just so huge that all you can do is put yourself out there, have a try, play with it. And yes, that can feel risky when you're new because you just want to take whatever you can get. But if people say it's too much, try these other pricing models and say, Mm -hmm. okay, well, how about we do a payment plan? Like there's lots of ways you can play around with it. Maybe it's not fun. Maybe it feels like stressful, but that's what running a business is. And I think I don't know. I, I don't feel like that's what people will want to hear, but I think that's the way it really is, is, is it's ever evolving and all you can do is play and try. I want to know, was that your And sometimes you'll thought? fail. It was. It was my <laughs> was final it? thought and you kind of led okay. me into it. But <laughs> final I think thoughts. I just, I, did, I didn't feel like we addressed the fact. We didn't yeah. actually talk about how much websites cost. And I kind of want to address the fact that this is why we can't say specific. I can say what I specifically yeah. charge, but that doesn't really make a difference to what you should specifically charge because you live in a different place to me. Your clients are different. Your skill level is different. We're in a different place and that's okay for us to be in a different place. And I started charging, I think my first website, I, I charged $800. Like I, I started in a very different place to where I am now. And over time, I spent slowly, slowly evolving and being willing to play with those prices as I got more confident, as my skill level rose. But at the time, I got the brand new businesses. They had no money and all I wanted was experience. It was a good trade. $800 for my skill at that time was a good trade. And now I would never do a website for $800. So, yeah, I guess I just wanted to address that thing of if you came wanting us to tell you how much a website could cost, we can't. And that's why I have always loved and enjoyed, you know, Sarah's absolutely being okay with, you know, where she's been and her journey and stuff. It's, it's, it's really good to hear. Cause I think yeah, and everyone, everyone, including David Blackman keeps telling me I should be running my business different and growing faster. And I don't care because yeah. I want to run my business the way I want to run it. And I don't want the high stress levels that other people have. So you be you. <laughs> is yeah. my thing of work out where your business is, what kind of clients you want, what price you feel comfortable charging. That's okay for you to be where you're at. That's the only way your business is going to grow. And don't feel like just because everyone's growing faster than you that you have to keep up because you don't. Absolutely. All right. However, I final. think there's a flip side to that too, to spin into my final thought, if I may. Is that where you're headed? Yeah, go. Because <laughs> we are way over. Yeah. Um, I but I think... Uh, I think what Sarah said is is accurate to, you know, try and figure things out. But I think also don't get sucked into, um, don't get stuck. Like if you, if you want to try some things, try them, but don't charge things necessarily based on what other people are doing. So like Sarah ch- 
starts her websites at five thousand dollars you know i have one that i have a site that i'll do for 3500 that's my starting point does that matter do i think like oh well she no that's just that's what i offer and that's the thing that i do it doesn't matter that she does that because i'm going to go out and sell a Mm -hmm. other value-based thing that she isn't going to, you know what I mean? It doesn't really matter what somebody else is doing. Your market matters. Like if you're selling websites in India, you're really in trouble for your rates, but, or, you know, <laughs> some like lower. Yeah, but your cost you know, of living there is different. Like, so it's all. No, I know. I was just making a joke, but anyway. Yeah. And so when it says like what the market will bear, like that phrase your customers that you're talking to, wherever they are, regardless of where they are, regardless of where you are, your sales meeting is, that's the market. And it's showing you what it will bear by seeing. And so just keep pushing the edge a little bit until you get yeah. to a point where somebody says no. <laughs> and, then, and try these other, the reason I tried the, the leasing thing was because, um, because I had some clients that had cash flow problems and a big website like 50% down was, was difficult for them. So I thought, okay, well, let's try another model. And so, and they loved it. So, you know, just keep trying stuff. Yeah. Awesome. All right, everybody. All right. Thanks for joining. Tim's like, I gotta go get dinner. <laughs> yeah, we're out of here, man. <laughs> yeah, we're way over time. Don't hey, forget everybody. to hit like. Hold on, I have a, a 10 minute parting thought. Damn. No. no. <laughs> Cutting us off. Tim, Tim is says, over Tim, it. Tim says, Dave and I have to record 10 WP the podcast episodes right yeah. when this ends. And I have so, a hard wow. stop in 45 minutes, and this is eating into our recording time. Oh uh, my goodness. Tammy, I hope you come back and join us next week. Yeah, I will. I can't yes, wait. Yay. Definitely. Awesome. And uh, thanks everybody. Bye, for everybody. Coming. Hope everybody thanks, everyone. has a great week. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye bye.